Welcome back to my YouTube channel, everybody. My guest today is a living legend in the world of espionage, actually, and it doesn't need any introduction. But anyway, we'll give an introduction anyway for whoever doesn't know who Morton Storm is, who was a double agent for the CIA and he infiltrated Al Qaeda. And uh, today with Morton, of course, we will talk about his very peculiar life and what he did as a double agent. Thanks for your time, Morton. Thanks for joining me today. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, and it's an honor. And um, I hope I can provide with you the answers that you all are looking for. Well, first off, I would like to remind everybody that you wrote all your story in this very precious book that I do recommend that everybody reads because you tell all your story here, and we go we'll go through some of the details today. Uh, so, first off, your story is quite peculiar because uh, for a while you. Uh, we're in a group of Islamic radicals, if that's the right word. Otherwise, we're free to cor correct me. Uh, you've been to Yemen, I think, twice. You have been to the UK, where you met relevant people uh, within um, Al-Qaeda. And then you changed your mind, and you switched back to assisting intelligence agencies in tracking down terrorists. Would you like to tell uh, us your story in a nutshell before we start with the questions? Yes, um, about my... From, from my beginning of life or just from from that time? Whatever you think is relevant, maybe we can. All right, okay. Then. Whatever yeah, you want. So yeah, but, so yeah, just in a nutshell and do it very briefly so people don't get bored. Um, so I was born in in, uh, in the town in Denmark called uh, Kusur in 1976. Um, it's a small uh, fishing village um, next to the, on the coastal. And um, I grew up there and um I unfortunately had a, um, let's say, like very troubled childhood, which which meant that I wasn't really uh, with good parents, and um, it ended up we, um, you know, I was kicked out from schools, and you know, I was a, a kid who made a lot of troubles, and and then I joined some kind of um, uh, like gang, or what would you say it? Uh, not really gang, but a group of, of foreigners, and we stick together. So I was good at martial arts, at boxing, you know, and I did. Um, I was very good at boxing and played football. So so that obviously landed me in more trouble because I defended my friends and we ended up in fightings. And so it just took off and off and off. And then um, uh, in um, 2000, uh, well, then I joined a motorcycle gang in a motorcycle club called uh, Bandidos in Denmark. I was there for two years from 1995 to 1997 uh, doing this uh, Scandinavian bike war. Um, I... Um, I realized that it wasn't me. I was seeking something more meaningful to life and um, more purposeful. I converted to Islam uh, because of I had many Muslim friends. So that way, I um, I started to to have a like I was curious about their religion and and I went into a, to a library in my town and I picked up the biography of Prophet Muhammad. First, I picked up the Quran. It was quite difficult for me to comprehend and understand it was even though it was translated in Danish I then um, um, picked up the biography of Prophet Muhammad um, and then totally I used to hate reading uh, but that book attract, uh, attracted me that much that I um, finished from page first from page one to the last and in there I made a decision that Islam I was going to convert to Islam so I did convert to Islam and um, um, and then I later on made a Danish convert, which you can read about in the in the in the book, if you're interested in this. And then I went to, living in the UK where I was practicing Islam. I left Bandidos and I left, um, you know, my past behind me to seek something higher, uh, to become a better person. So um, I converted to Islam, went to the UK. I lived there for a little while for. Uh, and then from there, I moved. I went on to study um, uh, Islamic science, and you know, is, study Islam and Arabic in Yemen. I spent uh, nine months, my first trip in Yemen in 1997, uh, in the match in Sada uh, with Sheikh Mukbil bin He was um, he was uh, one of the biggest scholars of today's biggest scholars in um, um, in Hadith. You know, in uh, in the sayings of Prophet Muhammad, in the, that kind of science, and um, it was very fruitful. Um, however, I became very 
like radicalized. I became very practicing. Uh, like I was a fundamentalist. I followed everything I could uh, to, to to my abilities. Um, it was black and white. There was no gray areas. Um, you either love or you hate. <laughs> you know. So I became a, a very hateful person, and I just didn't realize this because somehow it managed to um, put this uh, filter on my brain and um they couldn't because i would i lived you know the whole life in order to become a better person and what i didn't realize was in this process of me being converted within this fraction of islam i then became worse and they're more dangerous um, and that's only something i realized later so 10 years i was a muslim i studied uh, doing under several sheikhs and around you know in in yemen i was studying at the islamic university in uh, al iman islamic university in sana i translated four books into danish language about islam i um, taught um, islamic science to uh, people uh, in Denmark and also in in the UK, in Luton and, and other places in London as well. I became some kind of a celebrity within the Muslim society because of who my background was and my boxing abilities and my the people I studied under and my knowledge. Um, I then, um, um, I so I went back and forwards to Yemen a few times and um, also North uh, North Africa, like Morocco. And I uh, was, I met Sheikh Shinkriti and I met some, uh, not Sheikh Shinkriti, uh, some other Sheikhs in, in Morocco, I forgot his name, Sheikh Shinkriti, he's in Mauritania. And then I, 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 and the way that it just, life took me, I just happened to meet, um, during my, this adventure, I just happened to meet so big profiles that, uh, you know, I, it's like surreal. And when I look back at the time, I'm, I'm saying, how could this happen? Then how could I meet these people? But I wasn't seeking them. It just happened, you know. So I met Zakaria Musawi in uh, in Brixton. And um, not because that I was seeking him, but because we happened to pray in the same mosque. And also we had the same uh, people that we knew from France. You know, I have a French convert, uh, a Muslim who was a French convert, who was a friend of Zakaria Musawi. And that way I got introduced. And, um, and later on he became... Uh, you know, the 20th pilot of 9-11, I then met Richard, uh, the shoe bomber, uh, uh, Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, not because that I was seeing him, but again, because um, we happen to go in the same circles. And that's how things always developed like that. And the same with Anwar al -Awlaki. again, uh, it was a common friend who introduced me to him in, in Yemen, but there was an Australian convert. Otherwise, I would but maybe I would have met him later, but it was because of these people I met. And while Lalo, is the same with Omar Bakari and the same way. And all these people here, only because I haven't to be in a place where we knew people. And then somehow we clicked on, we, we, um, somehow we, yeah, we, we realized that we were like-minded and so on. Um, and, um, from 2006 was my last trip to Yemen, uh, 2005, sorry, and I left 2006. Um, my intention was to go back to Denmark and uh, become, I was studying at the Islamic University in, in Sanaa. So I went to Denmark, I was married uh, to a Yemeni woman, and then I went to Denmark to make money to work uh, in a construction to make money so we could make hijra to migrate to Somalia because at that time the Islamic Union Court were already establishing an Islamic state. They were fighting against Ad Abdullah Yusuf, this um, uh, this warlord who was considered to be a non-Muslim and, and a puppet of maybe the enemies of Ethiopia and so on. Um, for me, to go and fight uh, in Somalia was um, a big opportunity to to follow what Allah have ordained for us in through jihad and it, to reach maybe or to achieve uh, martyrdom through fighting the enemies is the highest level of achievement within uh, within the Islamic creed. So I um, um, I was so prepared to go uh, to Yemen, uh, to Somalia. Uh, I, and in between, I married my ex-wife back. So I had two wives at the time. <laughs> and... Um, and she was living in the UK, so I was traveling between Denmark and the UK. And then um, I went to Copenhagen from 
uh, Aarhus trying to buy military clothes and equipment for my friends in Somalia and myself for this trip. And um, on my way back, and my friend called me, a Danish convert, Ali called me from Somalia saying that the jihad was really beautiful. And um, and while I was in the shop, like I was in the car going to the shop, he called me this and he said, I just cut the head of one calf, one Bushrik, uh, one of the enemies. He said, the jihad is beautiful. You have to be, you know, we have to really look forward to come here. And I did. And I seriously, genuinely did look forward to that. Um, on my way back from the shop to my town where I used to live, this like the second capital of Denmark, I had received a second phone call, but not from Ali, uh, from Abdul Rani, another Muslim imam, Danish imam. He was Somalian, but with Danish citizenship, he was in Somalia in Mogadishu. He called me from there and said, Murad, that was my Muslim name, we have we have lost we have lost the airport in Mogadishu. I am sorry to tell you, but you cannot come. It's too dangerous. And I felt so betrayed in a way of I was so disappointed. Couldn't understand why Allah would prevent me doing what he ordained me to do and what he asked the brave soldiers to do and the brave Muslims to do to fight in his course. I was not it was not because I was going to deliberately I want to go and blow myself up when no, I just wanted to go and fight the enemy and then if I die in that process, then I mean say I'm a martyr. So I had good intentions like this. And then um uh, when I came home I I took my bag for the clothes of board and I just threw it in the hallway in my door uh, when I entered my door, my apartment. And my wife at that time, she was um, just looking at me. I just was so angry. And I, I said, please make something for me to drink, a coffee or something. And I went into the laptop, my laptop, like we're sitting today. And just something that made me question my faith. And I Googled contradictions in, Islam, uh, in the Quran. and. Um, and because of this, I and I never done that, you know, because we always taught. Um, there's a verse in the Quran saying, "Really, if this book is from me, you, Allah says that it, it will there will be no contradictions. If you find any contradiction in this book, it, it this would not be for me." So it was a challenge, and so I challenged. I took up the challenge, and I researched it for two weeks, and I realized there was a website called answeringislam.com or .org, something like that. Um, and I went in there and I really used like 12, 16, whatever hours a day, um, just researching them for those two weeks. And I lost my faith. Um, I realized that Islam, as many other religions, are man-made to me. I know for most people, they will not be man-made. They will be considered divine. But my conclusion with the evidence and for the with the contradictions and the confirmation of them that Islam was just another man-made uh, religion and I felt again that I was standing on a I felt like an empty glass before it was full of water or very tasteful fr fr uh, juice this time it was just empty there was nothing in it and I said what now what is the what is the purpose of my life where I'm going where did I come from? Because all this was just answered before. And I had some kind of, you know, I was certain about where I was going and where I came from. Now again, I was back in 1997 looking for new answer. And um, But at the same time, I also realized that how dangerous my choice was because and the consequences of it if I made it public. Because uh, a person who leaves Islam uh, there's apostasy in Islam, there's death penalty according to Islamic jurisprudence, so Islamic law. And um, and I also knew that I would lose my children if they knew because the mother will fight against it and she would consider me a disbeliever, a non-Muslim now. Not only that, the worst of the kind. And according to Islamic law, um, if a father this uh, apostate, he's no longer the legitimate father of those children. So, and I knew my children probably would hate me uh, and there will be I would lose the current wife I was with also. I would love my Yemeni wife. And uh, so I was like really in deliberate, like in a really bad situation. And also I knew at the same time that the people I used to hang out with, most of them would like to see me get killed and executed for my choice. And I also realized that the people that I hated, like Nasr Khadr and Danish, um, uh, Lebanese or Palestinian 
politician who was a Muslim. I made a fatwa against him when I was a Muslim, saying that he was a hypocrite and apostate. And according to Islam, death penalty was the correct thing for him. And also, I realized that Kurt Vestergaard, who made these Danish cartoons about Prophet Muhammad, that he expressed his freedom in drawing cartoons for newspapers, not only about Islam, but about anything, political satire and so on. Satire. And um, I was hoping that he could be killed and um, because he made fun of Prophet Muhammad. So in that way, death penalty for him was also, uh, death was also justified. Um, and now I looked at myself, I turned the plate and uh, how can you say this? And uh, I looked into myself and say, more than you are now, in their position. Now you are, according to Islam, a person worthy of getting killed. You know, you are not worthy life. And um, I realized how dangerous path, the dangerous path that I was upon. And I also realized how dangerous my network was. Um, and I decided that I don't want my children to live in a world uh, with a terrorist like this that I could do something about. I know I cannot change the world, but I knew that I could do something against evil people who wants to kill other civilian people just because they have chosen not to be a part of them or believe what they believe in. So I voluntarily um, contacted the Danish intelligence. Uh, they tried before to contact me where I had a meeting with them. I refused any cooperation with them and the British before because a Muslim is not allowed to be an ally with a non-Muslim that is mentioning in the Quran, chapter 5, verses 51. Oh, you believe, do not take the Jews and Christians as allies. They are amongst themselves allies, and whoever do that belongs to them, are amongst them. So that is apostasy according to Islam. But now I was no longer Muslim, and I knew that the people who follow this, from the, this ideology, very fundamentalistic, would like to see me get killed. So I said, well, Let's take revenge and let's fight back and see if we can do something good to this world. Uh, after all, I have the knowledge and uh, I knew a lot of people. So I ended up working six years, uh, almost six years for the Danish intelligence PET, Politics after Anis Chancellor. And uh, I worked for the MI6 and the MI, the British MI6, the British MI5. I have also worked uh, at the same time for the CIA. So four different intelligence services for three different countries at the highest level possible. And uh, I'm here today. Well, Martin, many thanks for this introduction. And the first question, very probably even a little bit dumb and naive that comes to my mind, is based on your experience and also based on the people you've met, what brings people to become so passionate about what they believe in that they join terrorist organizations? Yeah. Look, I don't know if I, you know, to be politically correct in this day and age, you are, I also have to think about your podcast and I have to think about what people are going to say. I have a project for media projects. I'm doing also a documentary and so on. So, Telling the truth today is not easy and it uh, will have consequences if it goes against yes. the mainstream and um, if it goes against the interest of uh, a certain elite. I will tell you very frankly that I have lived a very poor life today uh, for many years because I have chosen not to compromise with the truth. I have chosen not to be a hypocrite. I have been invited to the House of Parliament. I've been been invited to think tanks to so on. I have worked and cooperated with big think tanks and scholars and people like yourself and um, uh, to make books and to make this, but I will not compromise with the truth. And if they censor the truth, that is up to them. But I will tell you that um, according to uh, this organization, why do people join these people? So as I mentioned before, to fight Al-Qital or Jihad, in, to strive in, in Allah's uh, course, according to Islam, we talk about now jihad, jihad with safe, jihad with the word, with the with, with the sword. We not talk about the qalam or the the pen or the tongue or the money or anything. We are now talk about physical fighting. Physical fighting jihad is the highest you can reach, and that's something Prophet Muhammad also have said that whoever dies fighting jihad, you know, he goes 
you know, to paradise and to Jannah. And um, and not only this, all your sins are forgiven. So it's the highest achievement. It's like for a football player winning the World Cup for the national team. Uh, so it doesn't get bigger than that. Um, and, uh, and Islam means submission. And the person who meets, uh, means submitting to Allah's commands and Prophet Muhammad's commands. And um, n- not only this, um, I mean, if you have doubt, you cannot even have a doubt in your heart. If you do have doubt, then you're no longer a Muslim because Muslim comes from the from that word of submission in Arabic, at least Islam, uh, which means that you now you submit yourself fully without questioning. And if there come a doubt, you say Allahu Alim or Audhu Bilaim the Shaitan Rajim. You say Allah knows best, and I seek refugees from Shaitan's whispering or doubt. So you're too scared because Allah knows everything in your heart. You're simply too scared to even follow up in your doubts. Um, you just wipe it away in fear that Allah catch you in this <laughs> so um uh, so these organizations like Hamas we have seen today and we have seen um al qaeda uh, islamic state people call them isis or or daesh but i call them islamic state because that's what they call themselves dola islamia uh dola al islamia so that means islamic state you know that's translated and uh, the reason why the media called them uh, Daesh and to define other name for them is because they're simply too afraid to address or connect Islam with their actions. But if you read the history of Islam and the history of biography of Prophet Muhammad and how Islam was spread, you will find that these actions were included and that ISIS and the Islamic State is actually following uh, those um, traditional scriptures. So, and and this is this is something that you cannot. I mean, people can try to argue about it, but it is very weak uh, arguments that they have. Um, and all they will lie about something and miss out something deliberately in order to justify their um, misconception or disinformation in this way. And um, so I never used to call myself a radical Muslim or like, sorry, an extremist. I know many media have called me. He was an extremist, Muslim extremist. I was not an extremist. I was a Muslim fundamentalist. Okay. I was a Muslim yeah. fundamentalist because there's a huge difference between those two words and two nouns, you know, synonyms, synonyms, uh, what do you call it in English? Synonym. Um, anyway, I forgot that name is. But there are, um, this, this is two different things. So according to, to their traditional scriptures, so um, according to... Um, the Quranic text and to the um, uh, text of the hadith, books of hadith by Prophet Muhammad, or Bukhari, or Muslim. So actually, the, the what is the real mainstream Islam and the like the, the really traditional books? Whoever is, does not want to fight jihad, he is himself in a an extremist. So we see those really what I can say the groups of Sufism, the Sufi Muslims. I find them today to be okay and acceptable whereas many uh, whereas they have been uh, they are accept- they are looked upon um, by the mainstream and orthodox islam like fundamental islam they are looked upon to be extremists themselves because they don't engage in politics they don't engage in 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 in, in jihad and like in physical war um so so people who do like this like the qadianis and other ones they consider non muslims or be looked down upon so the reason why people join up with those organizations is because the they are the ones brave enough to actually practice what is written in the scriptures. I understand. Okay. If that makes yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. It makes sense. Well, let me ask you another question that is probably as dumb and, and as naive as the previous one. You spent quite some time in Yemen with people who were actually part of this terrorist organization. What are, like, an everyday day look like like with them? So, uh, I mean, most of them are very dedicated students of knowledge. So they study Islam. They're very engaged in studying Islam. Most of them, they have, they have memorized the Quran. They are, they are leading the, the maybe imams in the mosque. or they are, But they are very, very strict uh, following um, the scriptures. Uh, I don't 
recall anyone not engaging themselves in really deep studies in Islam. I don't recall anyone. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are all very um, engaged and very dedicated uh, to their belief. And um, a day will be, obviously, uh, most of them will have one or two wives or maybe more. And so they will be with family. They will meet up with the brothers, with their like-minded brothers, with the network, and they will have study circles. Um, they will, um, you know, this kind of thing. Some places, depending, you know, some places in, in uh, like in Somalia or like in Yemen, there will also be places where you could go and train shooting because Prophet Muhammad, he encouraged, he said that everyone should learn how to shoot and uh, to shoot the arrow and ride the horse and, you know, and swim and so on. So it's like, it's like a sunnah. It's like, a, it's a very strong, um, and also Allah have said men have to and prepare of you against the enemy. So they have to prepare themselves. So shooting and practicing um, uh, or training uh, with firearms and, and fighting all that is a part of building up your faith. I see. I understand. Well, I remember reading yeah. in a couple of interviews of yours, probably on the CNN, that you said that Osama bin Laden himself called you uh, to invite you to Afghanistan. That yeah. never happened. I understand you've never been to Afghanistan. Yeah. But uh, have you spoken directly to Osama bin Laden? No. Okay. What no, happened? No, no, I, I know. So, so what it was, I went to, um, uh, that was my second trip to Yemen. On my second trip to Yemen, I went on a on a Danish study, uh, what you call this, um, uh, a grant uh, where, where the Danish Ministry of Education um, they sponsor you if you go abroad and it was on the Danish Youth Education and so I chosen that I want to study Arabic and I wanted to study Islam so so I went to Yemen on at, uh, on my second this time sponsored by the Danish Ministry of Education and I studied um, Islam there and, um, uh, and my old network for, network from my first trip to Yemen uh, one of them was became uh, the career of Osama bin Laden, and uh, he was traveling between Afghanistan, Yemen, Afghanistan, Sudan, Afghanistan, and you know all this. So basically, he was became a big guy in in this uh, organization. I was not a part of that organization. I was never a part of it. But he he, he then heard about me because of my reputation, Osama bin Laden. And uh, I think a few months before 9/11, he he sent through my friend a request that that I should make hijrah and me migrate. And it was the time where where Taliban have just beaten the Northern uh, uh, Alliance, uh, Alliance, the Northern Alliance, and uh, with the uh, Ahmed Shams Masood and those guys. So, um, so they was trying to establish uh, Al Qaeda and Taliban was trying to establish this Islamic state in 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 Afghanistan with training camps with Camp Farouk, you know, where they're training on the monkey bars and you know all these kind of things. Kid just came out and it was my friend who brought out who smuggled out those videos to the whole world. And um, I I don't anyway. So so he um, and I was fascinated, you know, and um, I I never really heard about Osama bin but. People was talking nice about him at that time, and I was like, okay. And uh, I went to my language institute. I told them I have an invitation to to Afghanistan by Sheikh Osama, and he said, oh, please send him our regards. And that time, Johnny Walker was studying at the same uh, institute, the first American Taliban, uh, and um, and then he they, they were really happy. My teachers, so I knew that was it was a big deal. And I saw the, obviously the um, I saw the videos, and I saw Osama talking in the video and I understood that we now if they were going to make an unreal Islamic state with the, implementing Allah's laws over there then for me there was and uh, there was no option but to go um, however I also knew it was a troubled country and my wife was just became she just became pregnant at that time um, with our firstborn son uh, later um, he um, she um, she also wanted to go but I told her no I I want to go first to see how it is, and you can stay in Yemen. And then uh, she was Moroccan, by the way. Uh, and then, um, and then I'll come back and pick you up if it's good, and then we make hijrah. So, um, um, what happened was that I made my decision. I told my connection that listen, I'm not uh, going with my wife. I'm going alone, and and that somehow upset or uh, made Usama. Like uh, not angry, but uh, he, he was just saying, but mm -hmm. then he cannot come. Uh, 
because we want the families, we want to increase our ummah, our nation, our, the Islamic State with good people, and he must bring he must bring her first. So I um I ended up not uh, going to Afghanistan because of this, and um, a couple of months later, nine eleven happened, and and then after followed by the invasion of Iraq of Afghanistan, and it was just like, yeah, somehow something protected me from that. Of course, of course. Well, you mentioned meeting uh, Zakarias Musawi, who was not the 20th the design hijacker, but he was the replacement for Ziad Jarrah. In case, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because he was yeah. trained as a pilot. He was not yeah, one. So he was trained. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you recall about him, generally speaking, as a person? So we, we prayed in the mosque in, in Brixton, and um, he was a quiet guy, to be honest. He was nice and friendly, and... Um, so so are most of these people, you know, they are to watch each other. Everyone is friendly to a like-minded person, you know. It's only when the people who oppose you come and then you show your real face, you know. But um, but I think we have many faces. So we have the friendly one, we have the angry one. So, and But I never saw him anything where I said he's not a nice guy. And uh, we was invited to his apartment in Brixton and um, uh, and uh, he was into martial arts and but he was quiet, so I've been a couple of times eating there, and uh, that's it, really, yeah. Well, one other thing that you said that is very interesting is that when you change your mind, the PET reached out to you and not the other way around. How does that... No, 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 uh, no sorry. Maybe I... So what happened is that um, the PET, when I came 2006 to Denmark, and uh, I was working for this construction company, and also in for, for a Turkish guy who had like a furniture store, I, I was, she approached me the first time. Uh, at that time, my wife, the Yemeni one was coming over. She came over and we were living like um, renting unofficially apartments. We live in the Muslim area where there's a lot of Muslims and uh, strong, big Muslim popularity. Um, and then uh, they called me on my phone and and said, uh, Murat, uh, we are, we would like to talk to you. We like to meet you. We are Danish intelligence. I said, well, I'm not going to meet you guys. Who are you? Maybe, maybe you're Mossad. You're going to kidnap me. And how did you get my number? And they were laughing. They said, that's what we do. <laughs> you know, so, so yeah. So first time anyway, so they, they reached out for me first. And I I said, listen, you are my enemies and um, I am your enemy. And I understand that um, I will need to think about this. I went to the mosque. I asked the, the leaders of the mosque what what they thought about it and they said go and meet them if they're true if they're not Mossad then they can meet you in the police station because they wanted to meet me in a hotel so who what, what was for them to prevent uh, what was for me to prevent them maybe poisoning me or do anything else uh, with no witnesses so I called back I thought about it called them back and said well let's meet at the police station they, they refused and, oh we can't meet this is too we don't do this I say, well then you're not going to see me and then they arranged the meeting at the police station and I sat down with them and we talked about my stay in Denmark. They said that, listen, we are, we know that you're working cash in hand. You're not paying taxes. We we don't really care about that. But we just want to make sure that everything is fine in Denmark. Um, we also know that your wife is staying here and her visa have expired, but we also don't care about that. And um, so... They asked me like very politely what I thought about the world situation at that time, and um, I told them I was going to Somalia and fight because at that time it was legal like, according to Danish law. There was nothing against it, um, and I told them my opinion about them. I told my opinion about Islam and non-Muslims. Um, uh, I remember this guy. His name was Ole Udalite. We called him later on. He opened the cola and gave uh, he was he he gave me a, the, him and Kling and Klang they were called. They gave me a, a open Coca Cola. I said uh, from a can. I said I don't drink from you guys if I don't see if I cannot open it myself. I was really suspicious, and um, then they came with an unopened can and and then it eased up and we were talking and uh, and actually um, they were nice guys and one of them he he left a visit card a business card for me and um, somehow I kept it and when I left Islam and when I decided. To approach them, I then called him. Uh, I called um, that number and I say, uh, "This is uh, this is Murad Storm." He said, "Yeah." I say, I, "I think I would like to meet you guys. I have something to tell you." Uh, there was a little bit of silence in the phone. I say, uh, 
can we meet in Radisson Hotel in, in Aarhus? And he was like, yeah, when? I said, as soon as possible, we can be there in four hours, he said. And then after four hours, we um, we met up in this, they rented this king suite, or whatever, like really a, like an apartment, very expensive place. And they were clinging clang, these two guys, um, the ones I met in the police station, both of them were there too. And, but they didn't know why I was there this time. It's strange that I, because I was so strict, I say I'm not going to talk to you. You know, you are, you're my enemies. But this time, they, they didn't know why I came. And um, and I could see they were a bit nervous. I could see they were a bit suspicious. And the guy, one of them, uh, Buddha, uh, um, yeah, uh, the big one of them, he said, uh, Morten, he was standing with a menu card. He said, Morten, uh, uh, Murat, he said, he was, he was very polite to use my Muslim name. He said, Murat. There's no halal food here on this menu, but there is fish and vegetarian food. Would you like any of that? I say, no. I would like to order something with bacon and uh, and pork, and I would like to have a beer. I say, because I came here to tell you that I want to help you. I'm no longer Muslim. I want to fight terrorism. And they were like, whoa. They were like, they never saw that coming. And it was like the high fight. It was and then we were waiting for this waitress to come up with the food. And we were all sitting and we cheers in the beer. And they were like, ah, oh! they were shouting and we gave hugs. And they say, I'm, I'm here to find this. I say, um, don't worry. And they, uh, and one of them, Klang, he said, um, this is going to be big. This is going to be really big. Yeah, and it was. And it happened. Yeah. What is the most striking thing you've seen terrorists do to communicate between one another without being detected? So, uh, as mentioned in my book, uh, I um, um, we used a crypto system called Asrar al Mujahideen. Was uh, uh, it was a system, uh, encrypted system that um, um, that uh, Al Qaeda's technicians have used, or IT department, or whatever you call it, that they have used to create um, a, a safe way of communicating in between people and even when they were traveling with messages in USB sticks and all that. So it was um, uh, also an easy way to, and a very secure way to communicate uh, globally because you can only open this if you have the private and public key and you have connected each other. So uh, other than that, in the beginning, we used um, Hotmail and, uh, and you know, and, uh, YouTube, uh, what's it called? Yahoo and you know all other mails that was well we just write the message and then instead of sending it we would just save it as draft and the other one would go over there in in Yemen so I I would maybe write in London or UK I would write a message save it as draft I will then after one or two three days the guy would then open it in Yemen read it reply and do it the same so it will be that's how it was um, communicating in the beginning. Um, Obviously, they became more con security concerned, um, and they have learned from experiences during those years, and it ended up using Asrar Mujahideen, that encrypted system. And let me ask you the other side of this question. What is the most striking thing you've seen investigators do to detect the terrorists? Oh, you mean from the services? Yeah. I, I mean, they used me. Okay. Ah, okay. So that's human. <laughs> it's not It's not any uh, human. Human illiterate. Human intel is. I mean, I was the human intel on the front line. That uh, this is vital. You can use so much technology, but you need the human to look the people in the eye and also to see. You know, this many times the CIA tried to put word in my mouth about other targets, potential targets, where I said no. The man, he yes, he might have said some 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 stupid things, but I have been. I have met him. I looked him in his eye. He doesn't mean it. You know, he's. He's just talking. So in that sense, I also saved people who just wanted to look like there was something, but there wasn't really. So, But I also, also was a part of taking down those who were serious. Uh, and that's why I'm actually very happy. Um, um, I think that human intelligence is the most important of, of intelligence or tool for the intelligence services. Well, you worked with four in different intelligence services from three different nations. What are the main differences between them as far as way of working? Wow. Um, there's cultural differences. Although we are the allies and we are from the Western countries, there is major 
um, cultural differences. And I was, uh, can I say, blessed or lucky to to have experienced these kind of things because very few people actually experience that on first hand. Uh, and um, I saw how the British uh, have actually in between the MI6 and 5 have their own differences. And um, I have seen how the Danish and the British have differences. The Danish, British and Americans have differences. And I see that maybe the British and Americans in outwardly they do like each other, but internally there there are some disputes and really a huge argument and sometimes even hateful rhetoric. And um and 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 I remember in sitting in Kenya with in Nairobi with the Danish and British and American intelligence where uh, we were unfortunately uh, prevented to entering Somalia because of a uh, rain uh, flooded. Uh, there was a lot of rain, um, and then uh, the borders were flooded, and so I couldn't cross the border. So basically, all the, what we worked for those months and prepared for wasn't able, was not going to happen. But then the Brits say, instead of wasting your time in here, then instead of all of us wasting our time, why don't we we have another plan? And just because they have already worked out a really good plan. The Americans got really angry, slammed with the door, shouted, you fucking Brits and all that. You know, so why we, we were just Danes, we were like in between the two guys and and we were like really shocked to see that. And they used to talk so bad about each other when we were alone with like, like if, if it was with one country intelligence, then they would say, well, listen, those other ones, they are fucked in the, the idiots and they don't understand it all, this and that. So that was... Um, Inter uh, very interesting um, um, uh, differences between them that, that I have experienced, but not only look, check this out too. So what I, I was so I blindly trusted my own government, and my own intelligence services. What I did not know is that the Danish PET, like police, uh, the, the Danish the intelligence police, police intelligence, the Danish the police intelligence, that this organization, our missions were totally illegal because. Ooh. There, the, so I, I, how could I even know this? I mean, how could even, how would I find out about it if I didn't speak with some journalists afterwards? That that we are not allowed. The Danish intelligence for the police are not is not allowed to co operate outside of the borders, and especially not participate in assassinations or providing information that leading to to assassination of of people. So. And we did that a lot. So, um, yeah, we broke the law, and that's probably why it ended up that bad as it did. Um, and um, I will say that the British, um, the MI5 and 6, are very formal. Uh, I like their style too. They are very formal people, and they, are, they like to stick to the rules. Um, whereas uh, the Danes totally broke it. We were like unpredictable service um uh, which i just i thought it was all permissible so i wouldn't so i had it never crossed my mind that i did something out of order according to danish constitution um but the cia was um there was always a little mm, suspicion about them uh that you know that they were very nice actually i, I cannot fault any of those cia agents i worked with i really liked all every single person of them um but at the end of the day they are also very small in the in that system and, and they have to answer back to a very nasty system that i that was the system i didn't trust but i trusted the british 100 percent. i trusted the the danes 100 percent. but there was always something with the americans so Okay. And I found out that it was right because, you know, just to make, uh, I don't know if I should say that now, but, or if we have to wait later and you, uh, but, you know, at the end, I find, you know, at the end of my, 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 my service for those, for the CIA and the, the last mission to Yemen in 2012, it was confirmed that I was going to get assassinated and killed by the CIA in a drone strike while I was sitting with the other terrorists down in, 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 in Yemen. So, um, and I, I was warned by the CIA's own agent because he actually was preparing for this trip and they had to drive, they drove that way. So, so I was supposed to get taken out with a drone by my own colleagues, man. Can you believe it? Uh, and, um, yeah, it's very unforgivable. It's crazy. Yes, it is. Now, I, I, been... I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry. Ahead, sorry. Just to. I'm sorry for interrupting. And not only this, what's so crazy is, 
after I went public and all this, after they failed to assassinate me, they placed me on a terrorist list. I can't travel outside of the EU. I tried. Um, they, they have sent me home from Peru. They have sent me home. They stopped me when I'm crossing borders. Even within the EU, where you have to provide, so within the non shingle EU countries, I when I provide my passport and swipe swipe it through the system or scan it, I get held back and I get harassed. I'm sometimes the, uh, I'm not allowed to board a plane. They delay me on purpose, and I'm facing a lot of harassment since. Can you believe all for all these years? And to now, until today. This is sick. Yeah. How is the everyday life of a double agent? Because basically, you had to lie all the time and live a life that was not your own. So how can you stay focused being a double agent on something so challenging for so long? It's a very good question, actually. And it's very relevant because it either makes or breaks you. For me... Look, I was living as a practicing fundamentalist Muslim for so many years. It was much easier for me to continue like that than to find myself in. At the same time, I was parallel with this act of espionage and act of role play and all that. I also was in the process trying to find myself. Who who am I? I was also have to be a uh, father to my children. I have to be a. I have to make a cover for my for my travel and excuses for not to be exposed to be an agent. So I took courses. I became a taxi driver. I became a, law, a truck driver with, with, with bread. <laughs> I became a bushcraft instructor. Or uh, and and uh, I have to be. I took survival courses and I have to do so many things just to justify myself. At the same time, in the process of at the same time. Be so careful of not getting exposed, being so good at getting information. We can prevent terrorism and we can get those bad guys arrested or assassinated or whatever they do. At the same time, trying to find myself and find to become me <laughs> again. And um, it was um, so the easy part of that was to remain as a Muslim outward. That, that was for me the easy part. My difficult part was more in the private within myself. Mm. Wow. Okay. And and I also yeah yeah but I would also say sometimes because I used to travel all the time I would travel when we focused on the last mission with Amina and uh, and Anwar I was not allowed to open the emails in the UK and I lived in Birmingham at that time so I had to travel. Uh, so when I had received an email, I would have to travel from Birmingham to Copenhagen, open the email, travel back again. In the same day, within hours, and answer. So it was so frustrating. I was in places, situations, surroundings. It was sometimes you almost forget it. Sometimes. Wow, so, that's challenging. That's very challenging. While you were working for the secret services, you were tasked with tracking down an Al Qaeda leader, a guy by the name of Anwar Al Awlaki. That name is pretty hard for me to pronounce. Mm -hmm. And uh, that involved finding him a wife, and that lady should be like easy to track down so that you can track down the guy himself. Uh, what happened and why it didn't work out at the end? So it worked out at the end. Oh, okay. you mean with the Amina? Uh, why it didn't work first with the Amina? Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. I mean. um, well, I, I think it did work with Amina. I think um, it's a, a misunderstanding for many people to say it didn't work out because if it didn't, if it was not successful, I wouldn't have been continue communicating with Anwa and I wouldn't have continued to be the one who provided information and 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 um, clothes and whatever he needed from abroad and also money and whatever and and at the same time I provided also a career so that was that is the major success mm -hmm. and even okay. the recording of you know, of the CIA I made in Copenhagen where he said you played it his mission, you play the highest role. And and if you read what Sunday Telegraph was saying um, uh, the day after, on Sunday after the, as he was assassinated on, on, I think, on the 30th of uh, September 2011, you will see uh, an an official, but anonymous, he didn't go for it, but an, an official uh, person from the American U.S. Embassy in, this, in Sanaa uh, explaining how they finally tracked down Anwar Lauderi. And that was my person 
Oh, you know, my mission prescribes in, in 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 details, and even after that, because in the beginning I was like you, I was like, well, because I asked the Danish, said, was it us? What I just was told that he was, uh, uh, you know, as uh, killed, and I said, um, was it us? He said, he said no. I said, fine. Then I don't have that on my, you know. I was like, okay, that's okay, that's acceptable. But when I then a couple of days later read it in the newspaper, how they finally tracked him down, I. I saw, I read my mission in details and the person and the careers, the, everything about it. And I said, okay, somebody says not being honest. But it makes sense now because why they did it like this? Because if my missions were illegal and have to be, uh, yeah, it was top top secret, but, but illegal according to Danish constitution, then I understand why officially they couldn't say it was me. I, I get it, you know. I understand that. Um, uh, there, so uh, the head of the Danish intelligence would have been sacked. He got sacked later on, but he he got he would have been sacked at, on the spot, and there would have been proof that that I was working in this mission and all that. So I understand why the CIA said it. I also understand um, why they have did did what they did and why why they intended even to assassinate me on my last mission. I understand it from their point of view, but try to be me. Of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Absolutely. So at the end of this task, you did provide important information, and this was a major success, actually, as you just described. But at the end, they didn't pay you the whole amount that they had promised you. No. How they, come? They what happened? What is the situation now? So so they never actually paid me anything for, for that. Uh, they paid me for the agreement with Amina to send her to Yemen. That was the, our agreement, but the... Uh, Never paid the agreement for for annual allergy. There was uh, something they have held back and um, they prevented. And as Michael said, that guy from the CIA, he say it's like a football field. You play the ball from your side and you pass it on to you. So you dribble all the way up through the field and then you pass it to the other strike and he make the goal. I did all the groundwork. I did all the work. I do understand. I'm not the one who trigger in the for the drone strike. I'm not. I I understand that. But if it wasn't without me, you wouldn't have got him. So that was my work. And that's also the reason why I, even the spy museum in, uh, in Washington, D.C., that I am being displayed there as the one who did it because they have verified everything, who what I've been claiming. And if I said anything wrong or anything incorrectly, I would not be where they are now as one of, well, according to them, I don't want to show off, but I'm, and I'm trying to be humble now. According to the spy museum, I'm one of the six most important spies in history and definitely one of them one of the most ones are caught after in the post cold war against on the war on terrorism so i'm like that is a huge honor as you see that was you know and displayed in a museum for for this and that in itself is a confirmation to me you know i'm so honored about it uh, but i also show to the other world to the to the outside world that if i lied about this if if the, anyone catch me in a lie Hold all my credibility, my personality would be destroyed. Absolutely. Well, I can tell you that I've been to the Spy Museum in DC last summer, and uh, you're actually yeah. the first thing one sees with yeah. getting in. Okay. Yeah. So, yes, you're definitely uh, a very outstanding personality of this all. Uh, let me ask you something like final. What made you decide years after that you wanted to go public and tell your story? Mm. And then I, I seriously, if I if I could, if I had the choice, I wouldn't do it. Oh wow! Uh, so so I I felt it was a, a matter of life and death uh, to protect myself, and um, and and parallel also with the feeling that so many brave agents risk their life on the front line, many get killed. But imagine if I was killed. The whole world would think that I was a terrorist. Nobody would know the truth, and the way and that is a massive betrayal of what I have done to help, and a very ungratefulness by the services. So, um, um, I wanted to warn the people on the front line. I wanted to say, listen, be careful. You know, I ended up by almost getting assassinated by my own people, and you might be that one. Uh, not only this. I wanted to send a signal to create the biggest confusion and paranoia and, mm. uh, and frustrations amongst the people and the networks are used to operate within, uh, like Al-Shabaab and 
you know, Al Qaeda and these kind of organizations to make them not to trust anyone of themselves. And that would be so cool because they will destroy the way of cooperating with each other. And they will always like always be suspicious of each other. So in that way I wanted them so I, it was like a bomb uh, you plan some kind of I actually also have planted it to make people who are on the front line, who are like uh, you know radical Muslims, um, who are on the front line, thinking that maybe they're about to do something and maybe have some doubts if they met me in the past. And I have that later on today, like not today, but for after I went public, I had several of my old contacts who contacted me and they left Islam. Or some of them have just simply stopped being radicals. They're just like now more a uh, peaceful Muslim, a more uh, tolerant person who who doesn't want to do anything and realize that it was too much, you know, um, they didn't want to go that path. So um, so it worked out somehow. Um, and I told my story to save myself. And um, that was it. it. It had a huge consequences. You know, I... To do this is almost like a kimikaze in a way, but obviously I don't crash. <laughs> but I I knew that all the network I was working within and even all the Muslims would just wanted to kill me if they could. And if people, Muslim attempted in their mind to kill me, I have death threats, uh, fatwas. Um, I have so much hate. Uh, I lost uh, my freedom in a way. I cannot even live in my own country anymore. I'm living now in Bulgaria. I'm saying that, you know, but I'm... I cannot I cannot live in Denmark. Can you believe that? I cannot live in Denmark. There was a an attempt in my life, and the Danish intelligence say leave is too small for you, this country and Scandinavia. So I lost my children. I have lost my 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 career, like my money. I have been living as a poor man for a very long time, and uh, it's been a very tough life. And I got severe PTSD that I have to battle with. Uh, at first, uh, the Danish intelligence was not going to help me. The um, Actually, they worked against me, and um, I started. I sued them. I sued them for PTSD, and I, as the only person in Danish history, and the first one, I won, and I defeated the Danish intelligence, and I got um, awarded compensation, small one, not something like in America. It's not what the American law, very small. Um, uh, and and um, but I got some. I got like a 67 percent of a pension, <laughs> which is not much, and it's just. For survival in Bulgaria, Bulgaria is a, one of the poorest countries in Europe. For those who don't know, and uh, but it's just about on the survival, um, and it's very stressful. Um, so if people think I did this for fame and for fortune, it was definitely a, an own goal. If as, I mean, it wouldn't make any sense. I could have been quiet. The intelligence offered me money. It's in the news. Uh, we recorded. Them. They offered me money if it was, uh, and they would pay me this and that, and for five years and but I just didn't trust them. Um once they broke that sacred trust between us, it was over. Uh they started. I did not start. I was so honest with them all the time and I always took that extra step to come back with the best results for our team, for the world. And in the end I got stabbed in my back. So they broke that. They started. I wouldn't have done these kind of things if they did not do this. Well Martin, many thanks for your time and for your very Precious explanations and insight, I would say, this time. So I do recommend, again, everyone to read your very interesting and well-written book called Agent Storm that tells all your story in a deeper detail. And uh, thank you again for your time and for what you did for me this morning. Yeah, Yo, you know what? Anytime. And um, again, if you want to invite me to another time, you, I'm, you know, I will be very honored. And um and I want to say thank you for everyone who listened and watched this uh, podcast. So thank you so much. You're doing a very important job. Thank you. Thank you. It means a lot. Uh, thank Thanks, you. everybody else, for watching this. And see you all next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.